Thank you very much. Uh, we've already used up some of the time. Uh, let me share you a, a personal story, if I could have the slides, please. Uh, a personal story about uh, soft tissue sarcoma and how it relates today to this. I first met Kristen Ann Carr after she had had an operation elsewhere, and she was a remarkable uh, young woman. Most impressively, of course, she was relatively unimpressed by uh, myself and some of the other physicians she had met. She thought we all took ourselves way too seriously, which at that time I'm sure I did. And while her parents were terrified, she looked at ways in which she might educate me and uh, allow me to take myself a little less seriously. And one of the questions she asked me was, uh, Dr. B, have you ever been to a rock concert? Well, it's no surprise, I don't know the definition of goofing off, so I had not been to a rock concert. And she said, well, you're about to go to one. And so it was, of course, uh, Bruce Springsteen because Barbara Carr was one of his managers. And it began a remarkable relationship that we've had with both uh, David Marsh, Barbara Carr, and Bruce Springsteen. But of course, uh, I didn't have any idea what I was supposed to wear to this rock concert, so I asked my children, what do I wear to a rock concert? And of course, my kids told me very clearly, don't worry, Dad, there's nothing you own that's appropriate. <laughs> so no surprise I showed up at the concert wearing the exact same blazer that I have on today, the same shirt, no tie. The tie is in the pocket. Uh, but it was a remarkable start because here was someone who uh, was more worried about educating me and of course who went on to a tragic death from sarcoma. And what do you do to turn that tragedy into uh, something rewarding? And of course what Barbara Carr uh, did for their, uh, and uh, David did for their daughter was of course to turn this into something that would help other people. And that was really the beginning of uh, to do this. And the way it started was, Kristen, what do you need to fix this disease? A fellowship program where someone studies the disease until it does not need to be studied anymore. Kristen, okay, how much? Dr. B, well, um, not too sure, probably a million dollars. Kristen, okay, mom, Dave, let's do it. And they did it. So these two people turned this true tragedy, the loss of a daughter in her early 20s, into something that would make a difference and have subsequently raised several million dollars to support sarcoma research, mainly utilizing uh, the, uh, the help of Bruce Springsteen and many other people that are involved. And it's quite remarkable uh, what they've done and what they continue to do. Uh, and so now we have Kristen Ann Carr Fellows spread across the nation. We think those people have made a difference in how sarcoma is managed. Many of them went to uh, communities in which the word, as you heard from the Lieutenant Gunner, was barely, barely known. Uh, it wasn't the only thing that happened. You, many of you know Danny Federici, who was the keyboard player. He also died at Memorial of Melanoma. That turned into a fund to support melanoma research. And so here is a group of people in the entertainment industry that have turned tragedy in their own families into uh, something that makes a difference for other people. So what have we learned in the last uh, little while? Well, the uh, leader of the program today was just one of the many people that we were fortunate enough to have train at Memorial and fortunate enough to uh, write about these events. And if you want to summarize randomized trials, then you don't need me to come here. Steve Katz has already done it. So what have I learned in this uh, brief little encounter with sarcoma? Well, the first thing you heard uh, alluded to by uh, Steve Katz was the power of databases and the power of prospective databases. And uh, we began the database in, in, uh, in uh, 1982 when I came to Memorial. This is an inpatient database. All these people are treated as inpatients at Memorial. And as you heard, Dr. Espert, we have over 8,500 patients in that database, a very powerful tool. And uh, you know the distribution of sarcoma. It's distributed in all parts of the body. It's not true that I'm interested in sarcoma because it's the one uh, disease which allows you to operate in all parts of the body. That's not really true. But, uh, but it, they're an extraordinary opportunity to, to utilize those databases. And you could never do things like this that Steve Katz is to just apparently identify a random association of 
lymphoma with soft tissue sarcoma. You can't do that with 39 patients. But of course, with 8,000, you can begin to ask the question whether that relationship's really real. So all of this is not necessarily about randomized trials. We'll come to that. But it's about the ability to write down what you did, to uh, examine what you think, and then ask questions of, of, uh, of it. The histologies, uh, Dr. Espert alluded to the fact there's somewhere over 70, probably closer to 100, depending on how you define them. I've just listed the common ones here, liposarcoma, liomyosarcoma. This entity we call MFH probably doesn't really exist anymore, but uh, it's certainly got nothing to do with histiocytes. Synovial sarcoma certainly got nothing to do with synovium, uh, but we continue to, to use these names. And what have we learned from all that? Well, we learned, for instance, just by the observation, if you know the histopathology, then you can, uh, and you know the site, you, I'm sorry, well, if you know the site, you can predict what the likelihood is of that uh, histology being present. And it always fascinates me. I go somewhere uh, as a visiting professor, and they show me a retroperitoneal tumor, and they say, what do you, what do you think it is? I said, well, before you put the, the x-ray up, it's a liposarcoma, and I, I'm going to be right 90% of the time. People think that you're a lot smarter than you are. Um, what have we learned? Well, when I began, of course, we defined these lesions by grade, and we defined it in a surgical sense. That was low grade or it was high grade. It was black or it was white. And every one of you in the room knows this is a biological continuum. And we learned constantly about it being a biological continuum. But surgeons love this black-white event. And it's pretty powerful because two-thirds uh, high grade, one-third uh, a low grade. And if you look at them, primary extremity, soft tissue sarcoma, about 2,300 cases. And just by looking down the microscope and defining that as low grade or high grade, you've defined the probability of dying from sarcoma. And you can see it's very, very low here. It never quite goes away. Look at this, 20-year database. And if it's high grade, it truly never goes away. And so historically, we would just look at this early part of the curve where certainly it's dramatic. And that's a remarkable observation. Just look down the microscope, one comment, and you can define the probability uh, for the patient. And probably nothing more rewarding than to see this patient here who's been told by his referring doctor, you've got a sarcoma, you're going to be dead in five years. And you say, gee, you've been pretty well treated. Uh, you don't need anything more done. And I'd be very surprised if you ever had another problem, purely by just writing down the observations. Uh, I talked about histology. This is histology for surgeons, well-differentiated myxoid, fibroblastic, and pleomorphic. No surprise that that one entity actually behaves differently just by looking at it. And so now we've taken grade to histology, and of course we know that that difference is very, very different. Again, followed out for 10 years. Look at the continuing decay in terms of disease-specific survival, death from the tumor. And yet all of these are liposarcoma. So we know liposarcoma is not a liposarcoma. It's a histological subtype. And it won't be very long before we'll dissect these even further. Not possible without very large numbers to start with. You wouldn't be able to do that. And I would predict, of course, we'll break all of these groups up as we get more and more numbers. And uh, so we go from grade to histology, to subtype, to now molecular diagnosis. And that comes about a little bit because of this gentleman. This is James Ewing, who was the clinical director at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Of course, he was a pathologist. He wrote a wonderful book about neoplastic disease. And of course, he defined Ewing sarcoma. And now we know, of course, that Ewing sarcoma is not one entity. It's multiple entities. We wouldn't make the diagnosis without the description of the gene involved. We won't make the diagnosis of myxoid liposarcoma without this TLS-FUS fusion. Uh, we certainly won't make the diagnosis of synovial sarcoma without the presence of a fusion gene, SSX and SYT fusion genes. And of course, why is that, impo why is that important? Because of course, the synovium, it has nothing to do with the synovium. It was originally described because it was seen in the extremity associated with large joints. But then it makes the possibility that you can take those diseases and you begin to see Ewing sarcoma not, uh, you begin to see synovial sarcoma not just associated with joints, but in the prostate, lung, heart, peritoneum, kidney and tongue, brain. There's essentially no place that we haven't found that, that entity. 
wouldn't be possible without molecular diagnosis. So I've quickly taken you from looking under the microscope and how valuable that is to grade, to histology, to molecular diagnosis, and, and we're only just beginning. Those of you who have heard me speak, I, I like this particular slide because it tells you about biology, not just about outcome. If you write something down and begin to look at it, you learn not just about what happens, but you learn about a biology. And for those of you who have heard me made this comment before, I'm going to make it again. And here is the soft tissue sarcoma, local disease-free survival, the people who had a local recurrence. And let's just compare the extremity, the red ones here, and in 10 years, about 12, 14%. And the retroperitoneal tumors, local recurrence, certainly by 10 years, something of the order of uh, 60 plus percent have recurred. And then you look not at local recurrence, but at survival. And you can see the curves are somewhat different. The extremity lesions now, these ones that had a local recurrence up here, die of disease here. They must die of systemic disease. These patients here, the ones that had the retroperitoneal tumors, they have a decay curve that's not a lot different than their local recurrence curve, so they die of local recurrence. So clearly by writing down the uh, observations of what happened, you've actually begun to describe the biology, and that's been another powerful tool. What are the prognostic factors for outcome? Well, all, a lot of this work was done by fellows like Steve Katz and Joe Asbad and others in the room. And what did I manage to do? And uh, Peter Pistas was another fellow, and he looked at it. And then we began to realize it wasn't just about analyzing these, all of these uh, sarcomas, in this case, uh, extremity lesions. You had to decide what outcome you're looking at. I just told you about local recurrence. I told you about disease-specific survival. What about distant disease? specific survival, the presence of a metastasis. And all of those are variables that are different. That local recurrence, who's going to get a local recurrence? If you already had one, you're more likely to have another. If you have positive margins, you didn't take all the tumor out. But look over here, disease-specific survival. No surprise, I showed you that grade would predict. No surprise that size would be greater. But what about this, the positive margin at the time of the original procedure. How can that possibly be true? Because if positive margin was an issue, then everyone who had an amputation would never recur. So it wasn't about the failure of the surgeon or the failure of the radiation therapist, it was about the natural biology. So purely by looking at these events, we begin to understand the biology. We learn about lymph nodes. You see a lymph node involved in soft tissue sarcoma, Yuman Fong, a fellow at the time, and if you have a uh, liposarcoma, the likelihood that you'll ever have a lymph node metastasis is almost zero, such that if you see a, lymph a liposarcoma in lymph nodes, you rightfully question what is the histopathology. All just derived from these relatively simple databases. And what happens to them? Well, we know that if you get a lymph node metastasis, you can uh, resurrect some people uh, compared to those who have uh, other metastases. We know that if you have a local recurrence, the nature of the local recurrence is important. Now, this is self-evident because what it says is we look at patients, again, reasonable number who have a local recurrence, and look at those with an isolated local recurrence, about 13%. And it's no surprise, but we put numbers on it, that this busy slide says if you have a small, small local recurrence that's low grade and occurs a long time after the initial operation, then in terms of dying from that disease, you'll do pretty well. If you come in back into the office in 12 uh, months and you've got a large high grade recurrence that's occurred within uh, 16 months, then the likelihood of you being alive at five years is very, very low. Not surprising. Good tumors do better than bad tumors. But here we can put realistic numbers. Now imagine if you're doing a randomized clinical trial and you only want to look at people who have local recurrence. And, but the end point is proportion surviving. Well, I'm going to have these people who are going to be in my trial and these people are going to be in your trial and I'm a genius. 
but we never really thought about that till we began to put real numbers into that event. We're going to make it on time. We've taken that a lot further, of course. Uh, I, I just put slides rather than do nomograms by live. For those of you who don't know about nomograms, they're graphical representations of some statistical models. And the important thing is it, it, is it able to predict the probability for the individual of what will happen to that individual in a defined scenario. It's very important to have, to do adequate nomograms, you've got to have large data sets, you've got to have significant events, both negative and positive, and you have to have long follow-up. Sarcoma's perfect, because we've got 50% of people will ever occur and die, 50% won't. So we've got large numbers of events, but they're not so large that they push it completely. For pancreas cancer, nomograms are relatively weak because we have 11% are alive at five years, and so it's dominated by the fact that a poor outcome. So sarcoma was perfect for the uh, utilization of, of these uh, nomograms. So how do you do them? Well, they're pretty straightforward. You define the population. You define the outcome. I've already alluded to the fact you have to know what the outcome is you want, local recurrence, disease, death from disease. You identify the component risk factors. You select what are the other things that may alter that event, which may not appear in a simple staging system, for example, age or sex, uh, you construct the nomogram, and most importantly, of course, you have to validate it. This is it just in graphical form, but it's all on a handheld computer. It's, we've confirmed it. This is the uh, actual survival versus the predicted survival. You want that line to be very, very straight. It is pretty good because there's large numbers. You want these error bars to be very, very tight, and that, the reason they are wide is because, again, if you take a rare sarcoma, then in fact the histology won't get into your nomogram because you don't have enough events. Same practical problem as before. And then you uh, actually uh, can predict for the patient what's happened. And those of you who are familiar with these, we have nomograms for almost every disease entity now. And there are nomograms for not just for malignancy. So you come in, you've got a high grade, a deep lesion, it's greater than 10 centimeters, it's an MFH at the lower extremity at the age of 35, your likelihood of dying of uh, that event is 48%. Very simple to do. And the same, this is just another example, low-grade, deep, large tumor in the retroperitoneum, 37%. And you can go on our website and take down those nomograms if you want. We've validated it by using other data sets. This is just from UCLA to prove that it works okay. Obviously, you need to do that. And so it's transportable. It isn't just a memorial database. Uh, we can do lots of things with them. We can make them uh, histology specific. We can change, time alter them. Patient comes to see you a year after I've had my sarcoma. Okay, Dr. Brennan, are my risks of dying better now than they were before? Not only are they better, I can tell you how much better they are. And you can do that for any entity. They can uh, walk in the office and say, I've recurred with this local recurrence. Does that mean I'm more likely to die? Yes. How much more likely am I to die of this tumor? I can tell you that. Uh, you can add biological variables, and hopefully we can test the effects of treatment. That's going to be a little harder to validate. The principle is pretty straightforward. This is just we've taken a s s subtype-specific prognostic nomogram for liposarcoma by uh, Kimberly Dalal, another fellow in the that, and, and taking that and predict it, and you can read about that yourself. You can actually take... Uh, an intervention and see whether or not it actually predicts benefit. Because think about it conceptually. If you're working with something that is predicted and you've got something to observe, and if the observed is better than the predicted, the presumption is there's been an intervention. That's a very simplistic idea. It's very correct. The problem is how to prove it. And of course, the only way you really can prove it is to take internal data from a randomized trial and apply it a priori. And that's hard to do because we don't have the numbers to do that. And that just says what Bob Cantor did. Oops, I did it again. The next step in that is to take these two uh, Bayesian uh, belief networks. This is a very interesting idea. We're well, not an interest now. It's a very old idea, but it's an interesting concept for me because it's much more intuitive because it allows you to utilize, which remember, nomograms do not, prior observations. And that's what you do every day. You think about what you've known about previously, and you begin intuitively to uh, 
put that into your belief network as you predict what might happen. And what it really does, it says, following that, it estimates the probability of an outcome on the basis of known variables. And of course, it can be used with these data sets, and that's what we're working with at the, uh, at the present time. This is a very straightforward article, which you'll, you'll enjoy if you... Uh, and the key part for me is that it, that it re relies very heavily on an inductive process that allows you prior learning, which others do not. Um, it just says the same thing. It's basically a three-step process. I emphasize the prior information. Uh, you look at the experimental data you have, like in a trial, and then you uh, allow those to combine to look at the force uh, or the strength of which your observations will be. And that'll be the next form. I initially thought it would replace nomograms, but it, it's not going to because, in fact, the nomograms are, are, will become more uh, uh, outcome and uh, site and disease specific, which this will be hard to do, do with. But it's another powerful tool which you'll learn about. Uh, enough of that. It just says, I've given an example in breast cancer, and what you're looking at is you're picking out what, what, what you want. This is just taking the uh, physician uh, not knowing what happened, and it, there are various variables that you can look at that are either primary influences on, on outcome or secondary remote in, influences on outcome. Not enough time to debate that today. What about treatment? Well, when I began at the NIH with Steve Rosenberg, uh, we designed a trial which looked at amputation versus local resection and radiation therapy. In the 1970s, that was a really radical idea. The standard treatment for any extremity sarcoma was amputation. And of course, th this is a boy that was present at that time. This was a synovial cell sarcoma. The standard treatment at that time was four-quarter amputation. And if you want to know what we did to that boy, look not at, at the absence of his arm, but look at what you did to the inside of his head. And that trial was then done where we looked at amputation plus chemotherapy versus limb sparing surgery plus radiation therapy, local recurrence. Look at the numbers, 1727. It was a two to one randomization. We were told that we were crazy. Can you imagine getting consent from a person? Excuse me, sir, your son is the high school quarterback. We've got a study here. We're going to randomize whether we cut off his leg or just do a small operation, add radiation. Dr. Brennan, are you certifiably crazy, you should be arrested. And the answer, of course, was, well, if you go back to Iowa, you will lose your leg, because that is the standard treatment. But imagine getting consent, and imagine pretending that a trial like this had any power to predict outcome. But of course, what we showed was there was no difference in survival. And as a consequence, there was no difference in long-term overall survival. Look at this, followed out uh, almost 15 or 20 years. And that trial certainly it may not have been the key event that changed it, but it certainly essentially reinforced the trend away from such radical operations. So no time like the present to get started. When this trial began, the first Kristen Ann Carr fellow was in South Africa in middle school, and the most recent one wasn't born. So most of you need to get on with it. <laughs> we did another trial. Um, which was looking at radiation therapy. Wasn't easy to do, but it was a trial because we knew all of these events, we could stratify it very well and randomize them to receive or not receive uh, radiation therapy. And that was a pretty strong trial because it showed very clearly that radiation therapy limits local recurrence and that limitation is maintained over a long period of time. But even more powerfully, because remember the patients all enter here exactly the same. They're randomized intraoperatively. What it clearly showed was the events were even more dramatic in the high-grade tumors. And I've told you the high-grade tumors are the people who die of systemic disease. So now you're asking the question, in a disease where your death is from systemic disease, did local control make a difference? Because we've got a trial that just limited local control. And of course, it made absolutely no difference to overall survival. Or, I'm sorry, to disease-specific survival a very, very important concept. So another reason why you could get away from the, the amputation or the mutilating operation, because local control alone wasn't going to be the cause of demise in extremity lesions. It, we've already talked about it being uh, true in retroperitoneal lesions, a very important concept. 
People criticize me, says you're against local control. Of course I'm not against. It's a terrible problem for the patient, for the doctor. And it is associated with a bad outcome, but a lot of that is dominated by biology. I want to finish by uh, some self-criticism. And I'm going to take that trial and make a couple of comments which I hope put some of the discussions, even the political discussion last night, into reality. I told you about the trial, I told you that it made a difference, and I told you that it made no difference in survival. So then I began to think, can I use this as a model? And the problem was, we are so focused on only the benefit mattering. We've lost track of the consequences of what we do. And it's a great uh, example of, of what we do politically We're, and what we do in healthcare delivery. We're only interested in the benefit. We seem to have completely lost track. So let me self-criticize. In this trial that we did, there was a significant wound complication rate in the ones that receive radiation. Well, that's okay. It's preventing recurrence and accepting some wound complications is reasonable. But if you followed them long term, no matter where you look, the fracture rate is somewhere between four and six percent, not just our own data. So now I've got to begin that I've got a treatment in this entity that has some significant long-term effects. And I don't want to focus on the fact that I just picked radiation therapy. I want to focus on it because I picked a trial that I could self-criticize. I want you to think as we finish about this concept of the silent, neglected majority. And the way I explain that is, see, here are these people here. And it doesn't matter what the trial is. It can be anything. It can be chemotherapy. It can be taking antibodies. It doesn't matter. These people here were never going to recur. So those people can only ever see the side effects or the consequence of the treatment. And the more this group goes up, the higher the control group goes up, the more people can only be hurt. Think about T1 breast cancer, no lymphovascular invasion, low grade in a woman where the survival is 92 or 93%. And in very large randomized trials, we can improve that for, to 94%. So two people have benefited, 100 have been hurt, only one in 50 could possibly benefit. And 100 of the 100 have the consequences, no matter what the intervention is. So these people are the silent majority. And of course, what you want is these people here, they are certainly a silent minority. They're dead or they've recurred. It didn't help what we tried to do. They still sailed. So it all comes down to the size of this gap in here. How big is it? And we never talk about it. So I want you to walk away, hopefully thinking a little bit differently about this concept. It's not only the benefit, but the consequences. In this trial, the only potential benefit for those people that were in the silent majority was that four of them developed a fracture. And pathological fractures after radiation therapy, not easy to fix, not a minor event. This just is exactly the same, only I'm asking you now to decide it's about these numbers. If this is 20%, you may accept that's a very valuable advance. 20% seems like a large number to me. And maybe it, if this is death that we're measuring, not just local recurrence, that 20% becomes pretty important, doesn't it? But let's put it in a little more context. If you think about the bravest soldier in the war, it's always the general who's not actually on the battlefield. It's the soldiers that die. And if you're going to be the general, it's, you've got to understand that it's the cost that everybody pays. Now let's put the 20% in a bit better context. 20% may not be quite so impressive. Not my data. Look at this, medical oncologist. If improvements in survival and advanced solid tumors are incremental, we expect a change to be 20%. Improvement in survival from metastatic cancer would be one month. Now, if I'm sitting in Washington and actually understand a little more than what we heard last night, I'm beginning to think, wait a minute, maybe that 20% isn't so important. Maybe we should be looking at that in the context of what are we taking away from people to allow that to be uh, done. I've deliberately tried to challenge you. I think probably you will cynically say what has happened to me is when I first started, I wanted to move this up no matter what. I was a young surgeon. 
I then got more mature and I said, I need to do a randomized trial and I have to expand this. And now I've just uh, told you that I'm really over the hill and I'm really talking about these other events. I hope I've challenged you enough to think. Thank you.